studying through 1 Samuel 15 this morning. Uh, and just to do a little bit of recap, uh, Pastor Sean uh, spoke the word to us last, uh, last Sunday, and uh, he, he brought to us these two particular points, these two sins that Saul had committed uh, through chapters 13 and 14. Uh, does anyone remember what were the two sins? Right? Right, that's, yeah, that's, that's uh, basically the same one. Yes, indeed, indeed. So the first one is that he made a burnt offering, motivated by fear, right, instead of waiting for Samuel, right? You guys just said that. And the second one was that Saul led the people through a rushed vow to sin by eating meat with lifeblood in it. Um, so many other repercussions from these sins that it is difficult to even talk about it as just the sin that Saul committed. Because when we think of sin, <laughs> we normally think of a particular action, right? Like we, we commit a particular action and that is a sinful action. Uh, that is absolutely true. But I like to think of these as sinful situations because it never stops there. You see how that is? Like, it, it never stops when someone just says, like, I'm going to do this thing, and it's a sinful thing against God. And then, like, it, the, the story never ends there. There's always such repercussions, right? And normally, there is more sin added to it by someone else or the same person trying to cover the previous sin or whatever it is, and it becomes just a sin mess, right? And we will see uh, an even bigger example of that, I would say, in chapter 15. So before we get started, could I have a volunteer uh, that will pass him or her a microphone? And could someone read for me chapter 15 completely? Ryan can do it. There's the microphone. Stand wherever you're more comfortable. I didn't expect you to actually choose me. Come here, come here. Okay. So I just start reading? Yes, go ahead. And Samuel said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you king over the, his people Israel. Now therefore listen to the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I have noted that Amalek did to Israel in opposing them on the way when they came out of Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction and all that they have. Do not spare them, but kill both man, and woman, child, and infant, Jeez. ox and sheep, camel, and donkey. So Saul summoned the people and numbered them in Telam, 200,000 men on foot and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to the city of Amalek and lay in wait in the valley. Then Saul said to the Kenites, Go depart, go down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed the kindness to all the people of Israel when they came out of, up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites, and Saul defeated the Amalekites from Havilah as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt. And then he took Agag, the king of Amalekites, alive and devoted to destruction all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the foxen and of the fattened calves and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. All that was despised and worthless they devoured to destruction." The word of the Lord came to Samuel, I regret that I have made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And Samuel was angry, and he cried to the Lord all night. And Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, and it was told Samuel, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set up a monument for himself and turned and passed on and went down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed be you to the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Saul said, What then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears, and the lowing of the oxen that I hear? Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God. And then the rest we have devoted to destruction. Then Samuel said to Saul, Stop. 
I will tell you what the Lord said to me this night. And he said to him, Speak. And Samuel said, Though you are little in your own eyes, are you not the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel. And the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go, devout to destruction the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you pounce on the spoil and do what was evil in the sight of the Lord? And Samuel said, and Saul said to Samuel, sorry, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I have gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me. I have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and I have devoted the Amalekites to destruction. But the people took of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the best of the things devoted to destruction, to sacrifice the Lord your God in Gilgal. And Samuel said, Has the Lord as great as has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen than the fat of rams. The rebellion is as the sin of divination. Oh div- divination. Not divination's good. Oh. You got it. And presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the the Lord and your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me, that I may bow before the Lord. And Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you, for you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. As Samuel turned to go away, Saul seized the skirt of his robe, and it tore. And Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you this day, and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. And also, the glory of Israel will not lie or have regret, for he is not a man that he should have regret. Then he said, I have sinned, yet honor me now before the elders of my people and before Israel. And return with me, that I may bow before the Lord your God. So Samuel turned back after Saul, and Saul bowed before the Lord. Then Samuel said, Bring here to me Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And Agag came to him carefully. Agag said, Surely the bitterness of death is past. And Samuel said, As your sword has made woman childless, so shall your mother be childless among men. And Samuel hacked Agag to pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. Then Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house in Gibeah of Saul. And Samuel did not see Saul again until the day of his death. But Samuel grieved over Saul, and the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. Woo! Thank you, Ryan. That is awesome. Thank you, Ryan, so much. Uh, You can take it with you. Just turn it off real quick. You have to just press it. Keep pressing it. Just keep it pressed. Got it? Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ryan. I appreciated that. I knew it was quite a bit of reading, uh, so, you know, I made that petition only for the brave. So, good job. Uh, Church, there is a lot to unpack in this text, and so that's why I wanted us to read through it at the beginning, uh, to then just start analyzing certain parts and not read too much again. Um, But it's interesting, Um, verses 1 through 8 are basically the instructions and the attack on the Amalekites, right? Here's the interesting thing I noticed at first. Why did Samuel introduce himself to Saul, right? They very well knew each other. Uh, Saul had a perfect idea of who Samuel was, and yet he introduced himself to him, right? Um, Two reasons in particular. One, he was making a statement of authority, right, as the prophet of Yahweh, He was basically saying to Saul, I have spoken God's message, his word, to you in the past. And so you have good reason to trust what I will say now, right? And two, there was to be no misunderstanding that the Lord himself was giving Saul clear and specific instruction. God had decided to judge the Amalekites and had chosen Saul to lead this judgment in battle. Now, this is an interesting thing about the Amalekites, just to spend a minute on this. Uh, God had chosen to judge them because of how they had treated with the people of Israel. As they were coming out of Egypt and through the desert into the promised land, they dealt with them treacherously. 
Uh, and they were also a very, very wretched and wicked culture. Um, so God had decided to exercise judgment on them, right? And he decided to use the people of Israel with Saul at their, at their head, right, to, to, to do this. Now, here's the other interesting thing. When we read the very absolute parts of the, of the commandment, right, of, of, of basically kill all of them, get rid of everything that they have, and um, that is a very interesting thing. Um, it is very clear what Saul has to do. But there's something we need to know about the Amalekites, and it's that the Amalekites were present in very many areas of, of, of the land where Israel resided. Uh, the Amalekites as a culture were nomadic mostly, but had a few cities and uh, uh, settlements that they had est- established, right? So it is not as much about wiping up out the Amalekites from the face of the earth, but from making sure that there is no established presence of that culture and that people in the land where Israel resided. Right? So when we see that they are attacking the Amalekites and specifically telling the Kenites to get away so that they would not be hurt, we're speaking of probably the settlement which could be considered the, the, the capital of the Amalekites at that time, though there were others roaming around. Um, we will see as well that uh, Saul's reasoning for part of his sinful rebellion Uh, It's connected to this as well, knowing that there's other Amalekites still roaming around. We will get to that. I just wanted to kind of preface that for you. And then we have verse 9. This is the verse where we see, uh, showcase the rebellion of Saul against the commandment of God. We have that slide, I believe. There we go. Uh, Verse 9, it says, But Saul and the army... And notice this this wording, right? But Saul and the army spared uh, spared Agag and the best of the sheep and cattle, the fat calves and lambs, everything that was good. These they were unwilling to destroy completely, but everything that was despised and weak, they totally destroyed. Saul and... And the army. A very interesting phrasing considering the phrasing we will see uh, coming up next, right? One thing we notice in this is that it was only through their own uh, personal view, right? Their own perspective that they judged these different things that the Amalekites owned and the animals and the treasures and everything. And they said, this is good. This is not, right? The things that were weak, they destroyed. The things that they were good, they were unwilling to destroy. Though God had said, destroy everything, right? But Saul and the army. I know I've repeated that three times, which is very important. Uh, Moving on to verses 10 through 15. This is basically the accusation that Samuel brings against Saul and Saul's defense. Not much of a defense, more like him being defensive, but we will see about that uh, right now. Verses 10 through 11, the Lord says that Saul has turned away from him and has not carried out his instructions. Here's the thing I want to ask, church. Are these things, are these two things the same thing? They're definitely connected, but is the first claim dependent on the second Meaning, did Saul turn away from the Lord by not carrying out his instructions? Yes. But I believe the text shows that there is some nuance here. These things are strongly connected and yet not quite the same. For not following the instructions of the Lord, Saul could have been charged with disobedience. But turning away from the Lord is synonymous with a deeper kind of sin which is idolatry, a deeper kind of sin. So these two things, very connected, but slightly different. And we will see in Samuel's rebuke of Saul that there are two different comparisons that are made. We will be given more information about this as we continue in the chapter. But what I want you to see is Saul's inconsistency and lack of ownership. What did we read in chapter 9? It says that Saul and the army did such and such and such, right? Saul and the army. I think I've said it like six times now. I'm so sorry. Um, 
But hear what Saul himself says in verse 13. He says, I have carried out the Lord's instructions. Not true. <laughs> but that's what he's saying. I have done the right thing. Okay? Then Samuel calls him out on this. He calls him out expressing what it is that they had done, that him and the army had kept these animals and all that. And in verse 15, how did Saul respond? The soldiers brought them. Right? Right? Right! The text says Saul and the army did such and such. Then Saul said, hey, I did the thing that God said. But they... But the soldiers brought them. And this certainly angered uh, Samuel because we, we move now out of this, uh, this section that could be called the accusation, right? Into more of a rebuke, right? Samuel's not going to put up with this. Uh, verses 16 through 20, it says that Samuel confronts Saul and Saul responds again in the same way. Saul said, I have completed the mission. I mean, at this point, Samuel just has to be so upset with Saul. Saul said, I have completed the mission. And once again, but the soldiers took the animals to sacrifice them to the Lord. Church, let's, let's press pause here real quick. Let's talk about this because blame is a very shameful thing. And I'm going to get outside of the text for a second there as we try to realize what are the principles, the eternal principles that are being communicated to us for our life here today in year 2024. That doesn't even sound like a real year, does it? 2024, that's crazy. Um, but blame, first of all, can break the, ni the ninth commandment. If you are telling... a uh, if you're, if, you're, if you're saying a fact that is incomplete, effectively lying, to put blame on someone else and take care of your own image, you are very easily breaking the ninth commandment. Blame can destroy someone else's life. Blame can leave you with a secret burden and multiplied sin. Covering your sin with more sin only makes the sin greater. Blame demonstrates disloyalty and untrustworthiness. Blame shows that you love yourself more than others. Should I continue? Probably not. Blame is a, is a grievous sin. Blame as understood by blaming someone else for something that you either are um, guilty of or that you played a part in. Blame is a grievous sin. So moving on to verses 22 and 23, we see Samuel's rebuke of Saul. They were to all to be devoted to the strength. Indeed. So he basically said, they spared, they spared the best of the sheep and of oxen to sacrifice to the Lord. The rest we have devoted to destruction. Right. So it's kind of a right. scary uh, that he acknowledges his partial, there, his partial obedience. Yeah. Okay. Good point. Yeah. Indeed. Indeed. This is good enough, right? This is what we did. What, we, what I did was good enough, right? And so I let them do their thing. But he did what was right in his yeah. own eyes. He, Indeed. But there was a king in Israel. <laughs> Indeed. He basically said, I disobeyed the Lord to, for the Lord. I mean, I'm a, I kept the animals so we could sacrifice them to the Lord. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yes, indeed. It is interesting. I appreciate you all bringing this up because we will see as we continue in the chapter how... Um, just different signs that we have of the nature of uh, Saul's relationship with God. At the end of the day, this chapter culminates in 
uh, a true understanding of, of, the, of the depth of relationship that Saul had with God. So yes, he said basically, you know, is this good enough, right? I mean, didn't we do the thing that we said we were going to do? Um, so let me get back on track here. Uh, you good? You good? Oh yes. Yeah, so the rebuke, the rebuke of Saul, right? So verses sixteen through twenty, it says, "No, uh, no, I was already there. I'm sorry." Thank you. Verses twenty-two and twenty-three, it says, "But Samuel replied." Remember this, the, the big rebuke after the the defense, right? Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. Here's an interesting thing. Two comparisons. For rebellion is like the sin of divination. Why would he say that? To rebel is like the sin of divination. What is the interesting thing about divination? And if a follower of God was to engage in divination in some way, what, what, what are they doing? They're basically saying, there is something that I can find out apart from God that could be useful for me, is what they're saying. And that is rebellion. And arrogance, like the evil of idolatry. Arrogance, like the evil of idolatry. Saul did not fully submit to God's command. Saul thought he knew better. Does this sound familiar to you? I'm not speaking of one particular example. I have two here. First example is Peter. What a good example when Jesus has been continuously revealing what is that is going to happen, what needs to happen. And even that it is a good thing, that it should happen. And Peter says, let's just get away. Let's just, just get away from this. Like, this doesn't have to go down this way. What does Jesus say to him? He said, get behind me, Satan. Peter, how dare you? Right. <laughs> and the second example I have, I have these words in bold here. Fill in the blank with your name. For me, it says Felipe right there. <coughs> How often do we think that we know better? How often do we think that we can partially follow what God has commanded us to do and also, at the same time, do whatever it is that we want to do? And we think, well, if it's good enough, then I'll get away with it and I'll get to have the thing that I want to have. I'll do the thing that I want to do. We are exactly the same way. We are exactly the same way by nature. Now, verses 24 through 35, we see Saul's confession and the consequences for the grievous sin that he has committed. Now, listen, Saul provides a good and heartfelt confession that shows sincere repentance or at least remorse that is indeed in the text. Um, but also in this section, Saul reveals a detail that had not yet been given to us. Saul's motivation, once again, was fear. It says Saul was afraid of the men in his army who had this wonderful idea of keeping the things from the Amalekites that were good in their own eyes, to sacrifice them to the Lord. Saul was afraid of the men. Now, why would he be afraid of the men if we are not told of any conflict of ideas in this situation? My educated guess is that Saul might have tried to tell them at least once, hey, God said we should destroy everything. God said we should, we should destroy every single thing. And I wonder if the men argued with him. And sadly, the result of this is not that Saul was true to his spiritual responsibility 
But indeed, he gave in because he was more afraid of man than he was of God himself. Saul was more afraid of man than he was of God himself. And this church is idolatry. This is idolatry. While studying this to put together the sermon, I was reminded of a text in the book of Matthew, if I can get that verse on the screen. Matthew 10, 32 and 33. <laughs> uh, Jesus said, whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. Church, I don't know about you. My guess is that my guess is that most of us here can relate to this. But I remember when I became a believer in Jesus. And I remember the first few times of hanging out with my friends after that. And I remember their pressure about engaging in things that, that I knew were not okay anymore and my soul did not sit well with. And I remember the pressure. And I remember the conflict, and I remember the insults. And those things don't stop just because the people that have known you before are now used to you being a Christian, whatever that means in their minds. But those things continue, right? And Saul was not just another man within this group, but Saul was spiritually responsible for his men. And he failed to instruct to correct and to rebuke his men. Now here's the interesting thing that scholars note in this text. It does not say that Saul did not have part in keeping the animals. It does not say that Saul claimed that he was going to follow what God said and he was going to let his men do their thing because he couldn't convince them or something like that. It said that it was good in Saul's eyes as well to keep the animals, and to keep the king of the Amalekites alive as well. Oh, yeah, but slaughter all the women and children. Screw that. <laughs> uh. Felipe, I had a crazy thought. That it just, I'm just reminded that once those animals were sacrificed, they ate the meat. Ooh. And so they could have done this for a selfish reason. Indeed. Which is why Saul maybe didn't. Indeed. Too much, so just and a thought. No, that's a good thought. And, and there's, there's definitely, we will see now in a minute, how there is a lot of motivation to keep uh, the King Agag uh, alive, actually, from what we know of the current circumstances. Now, what happens later is Saul then asks Samuel to forgive his sin. Now, here's the interesting thing. Here's the interesting thing. What does this mean? <laughs> what does this mean? It means he wanted to look good in front of people. Indeed. Saul wanted the penalty for his sin to be taken away, atoned for. He also wanted his, his status maintained and for the consequences of his sin to be wiped away. Samuel proceeds to inform Saul that God has decided to replace him with someone else. This is important, church. I want us to stop here for a second as well and talk about this. Sin has consequences in this life. Sin has consequences. Now, yes, our God is so good that he enters into every situation and he redeems and he heals and he brings you back up and everything. That is true. The eternal punishment and consequence for our sin has been borne by Christ, so that has been done away with. Not because God forgot about it, but because it was put on someone else. It was put on the Lamb. But in this life, if you grievously sin against someone else, the consequence might be that you will lose them. As a friend, as a family member, as a spouse, whatever it is, Sin has consequences. Sin has consequences. 
for people that have engaged in um, addictive behaviors of whatever kind. So many amazing testimonies of God coming into that situation and bringing them out, redeeming them, giving them a new life. Praise God for that. But they will be the first ones to tell you there was a lot of consequences. And they had to deal with those. And in dealing with those consequences, God is with us. God is with us in every step of the way. So sin does have consequences. We will see as we advance also beyond this Sunday, beyond this sermon, and into the next chapters, that the repercussions of Saul's sin was never that God said, I am done with you as a person, and like, I'm just going to you know, make you deserve. That was never the consequence. But it had to do with everything that was under his responsibility, his duty, his rule, which because he was the king, there was a lot, right? Samuel then finishes the job that Saul had left unfinished, killing Agag, king of the Amalekites, now, it is believed, because of what we said before at the beginning of the sermon, that there was other groups of Amalekites in the land that were not particularly established, but were nomadic, right? And so for Saul to have in his possession the, their king alive might give him leverage with those people that are still present in the land. So instead of him saying, God told me, to kill everyone, including the king. And this is a good thing because God said so. He said, you know what? There is, there is uh, something else I can do here that maybe will help me out later. How often do we do a similar thing too when we say we're going to... Even if, even if, we, even if we, we, we carry out the thing that God told us to do, hopefully he has not told you to kill anyone. But... Um, <laughs> We carry out the thing that God has told you to do, and then we say, oh, but what if we have a plan B? What if I put something on the side here? Uh, you know, God told you, invest this amount of money here. Give this money to this person in need, all those things. And we go, okay, I'm going to do that, God, but what money can I put to the side in case that later something happens and this money is kind of lacking in my bank account? We all do this. We all do this. Here's a little bit of a summary of Saul's sin, the third sin that we studied in this chapter. And notice how this reflects on his relationship with God. At the end of the day, this is what matters most about this chapter. Saul kept cattle for himself and his men, for he was afraid of his men and probably had some personal desire for gain as well. Disregarding God's authority. God said, don't do it. This also disregarded God's provision and providence because he thought, well, I need something else. God is leading me, guiding me. He's with me, but I need something else. I can keep these things. <laughs> Saul kept Agag alive not for any humanitarian reason, but probably to exercise some kind of power over the Amalekites, which I just said. In his mind, God's might was not enough. He needed more leverage. Disregarding God's power. Disregarding God's power. Saul then lied about all this for a little bit and blamed others. He did that for longer. And after repenting, Saul focused mostly on his own status, as Barb was saying, and the perspective the elders of Israel had of him, which effectively disregards God's love for him. This is not only a text about obedience. Obedience is good. Obedience is good. Indeed, it says in the text that obedience is better than sacrifices. But this is a text that speaks of the shallowness of Saul's relationship with God. 
I want to make one observation here as we are coming to the end of the sermon. One observation. I want us to dwell on this. Throughout this whole chapter and more, Saul has only referred to God as the Lord your God when he's speaking to Samuel. Not the Lord our God. Not the Lord our God, not the Lord my God, not my Lord or my God. But the Lord your God. The prophet, Samuel, told Saul that God had replaced him with someone better than him. Now, we haven't gotten to the chapters to talk about this guy. Name starts with a D. But let me ask you this. How does this other person refer to God? But my Lord and my God. Church, hear this. Our reverence, our allegiance, our obedience, and our faithfulness to God can only be as great as the depth of our relationship with Him. He is the God of the universe, creator of heaven and earth, but is He your God? Is He your Lord? That is the question. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Um, in John 14, 15, and 21, Jesus said, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Amen. So could it be that disobedience is a uh, symptom of a flaw in our love for God? 100%. 100%. I mean, we see, as we summarize Saul's sin in this chapter, we see that he had disregarded God's love for himself. And so, what does the scripture say? That we love him who loved us first, right? And so if we don't understand the love that God has for us, how can we love him back? It also says that we can only love others as we love ourselves, right? So put those equations together and think of this. God loved us first, therefore I can love myself, I can love God, and I can love others as I love myself. Saul did not understand God's love for him. And so he was not able to love God and keep his commandments. Absolutely, Arnie, that's great. Absolutely. Is he your Lord and is he your God? <laughs>